you. Good morning. Can everybody hear me in the back? Wonderful. Well, thanks for coming this morning. We're going to spend the next hour talking about the very basics of growth hormone treatment and estrogen replacement in girls with Turner syndrome. And as, okay, hello. My slides aren't advancing. <laughs> Let's see. No. I am pushing the arrow and nothing's happening. Hello. <laughs> okay, off to a rollicking start. <coughs> huh. This is me and technology, believe me. What am I doing? Man. You know, I'm a Mac user, but I how do I, the a slide's not. Do you happen to have a slide advancer? Do you want to use that? That would be great to have a slide advancer. If I don't, I'll just use arrows. Okay, yeah, so Okay. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty intuitive, arrows. <laughs> okay. Well, as you all probably know, um, short stature is the most common feature of girls with Turner syndrome. It affects approximately 95% of girls with Turner syndrome. And when I first learned about Turner syndrome many, many years ago, I was taught that the growth failure seen in Turner syndrome usually doesn't happen until three, four, or five years of age. But what we know now is that sometimes the growth failure begins before a baby's even born, or prenatally. Um, sometimes the poor growth is noted in infancy and early childhood. Um, we also know that the pubertal growth spurt may be blunted or completely absent in girls with Turner syndrome. And so for these reasons, the average height of a woman with Turner syndrome is seven to eight inches shorter than unaffected adult women. Um, Therefore, the average height of an adult woman with Turner syndrome is about four foot nine. So what I'm going to show you is, um, hold on one second, Let me go back. I want to show you the growth chart um, of, this is the Turner's growth chart. Do I have a pointer by any chance? Okay. All right, well, I'll step over to it. Um, this compares growth in girls with Turner syndrome, which is the lower curves, with non-affected women uh, or girls. Um, and you can see for every age, girls with Turner syndrome are shorter than their peers. And if you look at how steep the growth curve <coughs> is in girls without Turner syndrome, compared to the growth curve, how much more flat it is in girls with Turner syndrome, you see that that's why the adult heights end up much lower. So what causes poor growth in girls with Turner syndrome? There are several factors. First, there are health problems that may be associated with Turner syndrome, such as congenital heart disease or kidney disease. And chronic health problems do affect growth. Um, there is an important gene that plays a role in growth. It's called the Shox gene. It regulates a protein that's necessary for growth. And the Shox gene is located on both the X and Y chromosomes. But you need to have two copies of it for normal growth. Girls with Turner syndrome are missing a copy of the Shox gene. And so that genetic abnormality is considered the primary reason why girls with Turner syndrome have poor growth. In addition, there are hormones that affect growth, the primary hormone being growth hormone. So girls with Turner syndrome do make growth hormone in normal amounts, but their bones just may not respond to it in uh, normal ways. Thyroid hormone is another important hormone for growth in childhood. It works together with growth hormone to promote normal growth. And as you may already know, girls with Turner syndrome are more likely to have low thyroid hormone levels, which can affect their growth. And that's why 
girls are checked so frequently, annually usually, for um, low thyroid hormone levels. And then finally, estrogen is a very important hormone for growth. Estrogen, in combination with increased amounts of growth hormone during puberty, provides the pubertal growth spurt. And so if a, a girl doesn't make estrogen, then they don't have a robust pubertal growth spurt. So let's talk about growth hormone in Turner syndrome because it is now considered the standard of care. Growth hormone was FDA approved for use in the treatment of short stature with girls, in girls with Turner syndrome in 1996. And there are a number of studies that consistently show that growth hormone improves the final height by about two to four inches above the expected um, without treatment. And so with treatment, most girls will reach a height of 4'11 to 5 feet. The height that a girl achieves is dependent on several things, including genetics, like having tall parents or shorter parents. Um, but it's also dependent on the age at which growth hormone is started and also the timing of estrogen replacement. <coughs> so what is growth hormone? Well, growth hormone's a protein hormone that's secreted by the pituitary <coughs> gland in the brain. The growth hormone that we administer to children is called human rec recombinant growth hormone. It's a synthetic form of growth hormone that's chemically, the chemical structure is identical to human growth hormone. And it's been in use in the United States and in Canada since 1986. So we have lots of experience with it. And then I always have to say this, just because the word hormone has connotations for parents, growth hormone is not a steroid, it's a protein hormone. So when do we start growth hormone? Generally, it's recommended now that growth hormone is started as soon as growth failure becomes obvious. So as soon as there is a slowing of the growth rate, it's recommended that growth hormone be started, or when the height falls below the third to the fifth percentile on the growth chart. And we have recent studies um, that suggest that starting growth hormone at an early age like one year to four years, results in girls reaching an adult height that is in the normal range within about two years of treatment or close to school age. Um, the best height, height outcomes in girls um, are, are in girls who have taller parents, girls who are taller at the start of therapy, girls who have a younger age when they start treatment, or who have a longer duration of growth hormone treatment. And obviously, the decision to start growth hormone is a really personal one that is made um, between you and um, your child's healthcare provider. So these are just recommendations um, based on what we know about outcomes, but obviously it's a, it's a personal decision that you discuss with your healthcare provider. So how is growth hormone given? It's given as an injection into the fatty tissue beneath the skin, which is called a subcutaneous injection. And it's usually given six or seven nights a week. The injections are typically given at night because growth hormone is secreted uh, naturally at night. So we think it's more physiologic or more like nature to give it in the evening. Um, and the injection devices that are used to give the growth hormone make it very um, easy, convenient, and there's virtually no pain. Um, and I always um, tell my patients that the needle that's used to give the growth hormone is about as long and as thick as an eyelash. And so it's, it's virtually, you, you almost can't tell you've been given a shot. So how long do we give growth hormone? Well, it's a commitment. Um, growth hormone is usually continued until growth is nearly complete. And we know a girl's growth is nearing completion when that growth rate falls to about an inch for the preceding year. Um, it becomes real obvious when you look at the growth chart. Um, and that usually happens when the bone age is about 14 years. But again, the decision to stop growth hormone is always individualized for the patient. Um, 
Yeah, they're not, it's usually, they are not usually, don't usually have a delayed bone age. Yeah, did she get a, has she had a bone age done? No. Okay. September. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, I guess she's very, she's very new and, and she would like to be able to potentially. Yes. Yeah. I saw a patient exactly this way this week myself. Yeah. Who so just got diagnosed. There, I guess, why yeah. Totally right. Okay. Right. So she may have growth potential. I mean, that's why you have to do the bone age, because she may have some growth potential. Will the doctor ask for another um, growth plate scan prior to deciding to stop the growth plate mm-hmm. Usually, usually. That's the best way to um, determine how much growth potential there is. Um, but as I said, it all sort of becomes a, a clear picture. You see a growth rate that really starts to slow down. And the bone age, when the, about the time the bone age is around 14. So, yeah. so the benefits of growth hormone, obviously growth hormone makes children grow faster. So you do see an increase in the growth rate. There may be some improvement in body proportions. What's very important is that there it may be, or often is an improvement in body composition. And by that, I mean there's an increase in lean muscle and a decrease in body fat, particularly abdominal fat. And I'm not saying that growth hormone makes you bulk up, you know, like a a steroid, Um, but it does tend to make make you leaner, um, which is important for your health. So it it gives you a healthier body composition. It may be associated with lower diastolic blood pressure. It may improve lipid profile, so it's an important uh, hormone with many benefits besides growth. Can I ask one more quick question? Sure. Is this related to the growth hormone? You said that, um, that most young girls actually produce an only amount of mm-hmm. hormone, so are we adding just double the amount and, or a certain amount to compensate for the missing endoscopy? So, it's almost as though the bones are resistant to the action of growth hormone. And so, based on studies of girls with um, being treated with growth hormone, girls with Turner syndrome, we know uh, sort of an appropriate dose range. And so, we, we begin with that dose range. And there's some lab tests that we can use to monitor and make sure that we're giving enough without over-treating. Um, so, yes, we're, we're adding to what a normal amount, but trying to do it in a very safe way. So as with any medication, there are always risks associated with treatment. Fortunately, they're infrequent with growth hormone. Um, Fluid retention can happen, so that can lead to swelling of the hands and feet. Um, Fluid retention can also cause increased pressure in the fluid that circulates the brain, leading to really severe headaches. And um, that, the headaches, that's called benign, notice it's the word benign, intracranial hypertension. Um, Generally, the side effects are rare, and they're more common early on in treatment, so the first six months to a year of treatment. um, The fluid retention is reversible. If you stop treatment, um, that swelling usually goes away, the headaches improve. And in our center, what we do to minimize this is when we start patients on growth hormone, we start them off on a really low dose and gradually work up to a full dose over about a month. And if we need to, we can go slower than that. Some other risks of growth hormone. Well, this is a mouthful. This is called, this side effect is called slip capital femoral epiphysis, or SCIFI. And that is when the ball of the hip joint separates from the thigh bone. So if you think about your thigh bone, the top of it is shaped like a ball and it fits in the hip socket. And if the ball slips off and separates from the thigh bone, that can cause pain in the hips, thigh, and knee. Uh, It causes limping, difficulty moving the leg. If those symptoms occur, 
We order an x-ray of the hips. Um, if a child has skiffy, we will generally stop treatment until the skiffy is treated. Um, I have actually, in 18 years, I've seen very few patients develop skiffy, but we monitor it. We ask about hip, thigh, knee pain at every visit. Um, another thing I want to mention is that growth hormone makes you grow faster. And we know that rapid growth can um, make um, scoliosis, which is a lateral curve of the spine, get worse. Girls with Turner syndrome already have a greater chance of developing scoliosis. It's 20 to 35%, depending on what study you read. It's not clear whether growth hormone makes, um, increases the risk compared to other kids, but we do know that the growth hormone doesn't generally cause the scoliosis to progress to the point where um, they need surgical correction. So I have lots of patients who have scoliosis who take growth hormone and are able to stay on their growth hormone as long as they're monitored by their orthopedic surgeon. And then finally, I want to mention that um, girls with Turner syndrome often have lots of pigmented nevi or moles, and growth hormone can increase the number and the size of those um, nevi, but it doesn't increase the risk that they're gonna become malignant. Yes. No, oh, no, but yeah. yes, okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, in terms of growth hormone and the heart, um, growth hormone does not increase the risk of aortic root dilatation, um, and uh, girls have normal growth of their left ventricle comparable to healthy girls. And really, anybody with expertise, um, join, chime in if you have something to contribute. I know there are some experts in here. So once your child starts growth hormone, what can you expect? Well, the first thing you can expect is better growth. Particularly in the first two years of life, that it's the time with the most rapid growth. And after a couple years, the growth often slows into a normal but steady rate. Um, there may be an increase in weight as girls get taller. Um, I often see an increase in appetite as girls grow faster. Uh, an increase in muscle mass and a decrease in body fat, an increase in strength, stamina, and coordination are also seen. When your child starts growth hormone, you can expect that you will be seeing your healthcare provider about every three to four months. Um, care, very careful measurement of height and weight, then that will be plotted on the growth chart and shared with you. You will be asked about side effects, hip, thigh, knee pain, headaches, um, a good physical examination, including uh, looking at the spine and evaluating for scoliosis. And um, there's some variability in this, but labs and x-rays, um, x-rays generally every year or so, labs maybe more often um, to monitor um, growth factor levels in response to treatment. The dose may be adjusted based on a number of parameters, how fast your child is growing, how much weight they've gained, and also labs. And as I said earlier, clinic visits in our center occur every three to four months. 
intermission. This is one of my patients with growth hormone, <laughs> enjoying her ice cream. So do you have questions about growth hormone? Because we're going to shift her. Yes. No, it's, an, it's a bone age x-ray. So a bone age x-ray is an x-ray of the left hand and wrist. And we are able to look at the growth plates of the growing centers of the bones of the hands and wrists, assign a bone age. And that tells you whether the gro growth plates are when, when they're starting to close. It also gives you an idea of the growth potential. So those are monitored every year or so. Yes. I have a couple different questions. So, sure. My daughter takes a very, very low dose of, I don't know the exact um, name, but it's not some kind of symptom. It's called uh, it's levothyroxine. Yeah, yes. so that's exactly yeah, uh -huh. a very low dose of that uh -huh. um, in conjunction to growth hormone. Mm -hmm. And can you explain a little bit how those two together, the way it's described to me, those two together help one another work a little bit better? They do. Well, in order for the growth hormone to work, you have to have, it's sort of synergistic. You have to have normal amounts of thyroid hormone. Okay. So the two together are, are really important. So if somebody's really hypothyroid and they're on growth hormone, they may not have the res a really good response if their thyroid hormone levels aren't also it's normal. Like right on the border, and so her endocrine's kind of like, eh, she doesn't need it, but it would help. And so is, is there any side effects to it? No, it's really safe, and, and a lot of times we will err on the side of, let's go ahead, and, and if somebody's kind of borderline, let's go ahead and give a low, to low dose. You monitor labs. I'm sure if she's getting her labs monitored every four to six months to make sure she's not being over-treated, but really, um, that's a very safe thing to do. Yeah. And I have one other question. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you measure the dosage? So obviously they start at a dose, Okay, so so there's a, a recommended dose, and it's a crazy dosing schedule for growth hormone. It's milligrams per kilogram of weight per week. Then so it's it's really it's weird. The same for the last day. Yeah, so a lot of places, um, a lot of centers will measure a blood test called IGF-1. IGF-1 is a protein, a growth factor that your body produces in response to growth hormone. And so our job is to make sure those growth factors are in the upper end of the normal range, but not too far above normal because then we worry about side effects. So that's one way to, so both of those things, the dose per body weight and keeping an eye on the IGF-1 to make sure we're not under-treating or over-treating. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yes. Um, so we were told to give her names, and I know you said it's variable. When my daughter was first seen by a pediatric endocrinologist, he said something very similar where it's like an age or bone age scan, and then we moved, and um, she had said that she's not, I, I mean, I, from my understanding, I don't think she's planning on doing it at all. So do you think that's something I should advocate for, or do you think her <coughs> How old is your daughter? She's, She's five. five. Is she on the growth chart? Um, like 0.5% on the normal. She's on the five. Is she tracking along the fifth? Like every time she comes in, she's sort of following. No, it's like 0.5. Like she's below 1% on the normal. Oh, okay. Huh. Well, um, is she drifting farther off the chart? Okay, but she's but still below. Yeah. yeah, she's definitely much, much smaller than her peers. And, and her height is, is not on the chart, it's, it's below the chart? I mean, I think it's. It's five is less than 2%. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, the lowest line on the chart is the third percentile. Well, I guess she technically is on the very, very bottom. Yeah. yeah. So th that's where there's, you know, wiggle room based on you know you and and your provider but if she's tracking along the third percentile you know it may be that they just want to follow her a little bit longer um so that that's where there's some you know some differences in how people practice um do you know does she have a delayed bone age well there i think she has a 
have that bondage that's taken on to us very from the previous mm-hmm. pediatric, but we don't have another one to compare it to. Mm-hmm. And I believe you told me too that there is a small risk that it could accelerate the closing or the. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't think so. Um, I would bring. I would just, you know, say bring this up. You know, okay. can we review this and? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any anything else? Yes. Um, so I mean, certainly it's it's a lot of input. You know, injections every night for potentially fourteen years or maybe a couple of inches. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that it's the first couple of years where they see the, the most amount of growth. So have folks ever done it where you just do it for a couple of years and then say we've gotten the biggest boost and then we're gonna. But the important thing is it then allows, it then causes the the girl to continue to have normal, steady growth. And so the risk is if you get them up to a a normal height for their age and you take the growth hormone away, their growth weight will slow back down and over time you will have lost what you've gained. So you're right, it is a big commitment and as someone a mentor once told me nobody ever died from short stature, right? So it is, I mean, it, it's, it's a big decision. Um, I would say most of my patients, once they, once they are on it and they realize that it's, it's not painful, the pen devices are, for the most part, really convenient, um, it becomes just part of life. Like, you know, some kids use an inhaler, or some kids get a growth hormone shot. They just just becomes part of their life. Yeah. I think one of the reasons I asked too is because I've, I've sort of heard the opposite. Like I've heard a lot of just in people talking about their girls who are taking it more around the adolescent age that they're really struggling and don't want to do it, don't want to go to the doctor. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, because you know, the first few years you're on it, you're, you're seeing a really dramatic response and that's really motivating for you to stay on it. And I mean, teenagers, you know, by the time they're 12, 13, it's like, I've been doing this for eight years, I'm tired of it. And so you have to coach them through that, I and mean, that's typical adolescence. Do you find that most of the older girls in the young 20s or early late teens are happier with Yes, and in fact, there is a Danish study that looked at young adult women, like late teens, early 20s, who had growth hormone treatment and estrogen administered at, and the estrogen at an age appropriate time, and their quality of life scores are comparable to women who don't have Turner syndrome, and in some categories, they're actually higher. So I do think that there's something about growing well, especially when you're in school and you're comparing yourself to other children, is, is important for self-esteem. Yeah, you, you know, I mean, you, you compare yourself. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's important. And certainly when we talk about estrogen, the whole timing of puberty and going through puberty at a time when your friends are is also, I think, important for self-esteem. Yes? That was what she was talking about. This is my daughter's grandmother. Oh, okay. She was just diagnosed uh, three months ago. Okay. Three and a half. And we were looking at all this stuff up on growth porn, and I was so scared. And I actually went on the... Turner syndrome Facebook site. Uh-huh. And so I have a question for all yeah. the girls and the girls that didn't do growth hormone. And I said, Are you glad that your parents made you do that every night? Even though you probably cried mm-hmm. and not one of them said they were. And that was how yeah. I decided. I said, Yeah. Which, yeah. I said, it scares me. All those things. I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. yeah it's the really. It doesn't scare me. And her cry, it's more of. Uh, side effects. Two to four inches, and then those side effects. Yeah, that those side crazy. effects are so rare. Because she's perfect to be, but I want her to be happy. Of course, of course. You know, so we I have. have girls that have her, so yeah. Right, yeah, her. yeah. Side effects are really rare. I mean, you have to tell people. I mean, there, there are reported side effects. They occasionally happen, just like if you took an aspirin. I mean, yeah. You know, but like headaches. Like she, if she says, "Mommy had her," you can give like. Ibuprofen. Yeah, so the growth hormone, the headaches that happen with growth hormone are severe, They're, and but they happen early on in treatment. They're rare. We have ways to, to deal with it, but they're not the kind of things that for the whole time she's on treatment, she's going to okay. be prone to headaches. Yeah, okay. I just have a really quick question. Yeah. Since you are an RN, do you have any really neat tips on transitioning, I'm sorry, not my daughter's three, and transitioning her into trying to get her to be more excited or cooperative? and giving the injection. We've been doing it for a year. 
Ah. She bites it as a routine. She bites it. I know it doesn't hurt her. Um, so. Do you give her choice? Do you get her let her choose which arm leg? I've tried that. Okay. Bribery. I've tried sticker chart. Sticker charts. I've tried Ooh. watching the iPad and the movie. I've tried to give her the option to push the button. Yeah, I know. Those are all the good things. Okay. <laughs> you know, it just often oh usually. God. It get it just that usually just gets better. Um, <laughs> I tried sneaking up on her. <laughs> you know, I have parents who give it at night when their child's asleep and they don't wake up. That's what I do when they're asleep. Yeah, I, I I do. I parents tell me, you know, I give it at night while she's asleep. She doesn't even wake up, and that's a judgment you have to make about whether or not that would be okay for her. But. So awesome. Yeah. Yes. Much, much younger. Um, and the peers, and so that can just really cause a lot of self esteem issues. You know, adolescence is a really tricky time anyway for anybody with or without Down syndrome. And so to then feel like you're the size of an eight year old and being treated like an eight year old can be really problematic. Yeah, I, I have. You know, patients who are 13, 14, and they go to the restaurant and they're given the children's menu, and it just galls them. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, that's rough. Anything else before we go on to? Yes. It's, it's individualized. You know, it's it's usually 14, 15, 16 in there. Could you say that growth hormone um, can still be given when they're getting estrogen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The two together provide that good pubertal growth spurt <laughs> yeah. you're looking for. Okay. We we're gonna move on to estrogen. So, up to 30 percent of girls with Turner syndrome will enter puberty spontaneously. But ultimately, about 90% of women with Turner syndrome will develop ovarian failure. So the girls who are mo more likely to enter puberty spontaneously are girls with um, mosaicism for Turner syndrome. Um, so just keep in mind that you know 30% will enter puberty spontaneously. So before we talk about Turner syndrome um, in particular, let's talk about what happens in puberty. Just a review. Um, first of all, development of what we call the secondary sex characteristics, breasts, pubic hair, axillary hair, um, that's externally. Internally, what's happening to a girl is her internal reproductive organs are also getting bigger and maturing. And these changes follow a really predictable sequence. Initially, what happens is the pituitary gland begins to send signals to the ovaries, stimulating them to produce estrogen. And um, the first sign of puberty, or the first sign that estrogen is now being in, uh, produced, is breast development, or breast buds. As a girl continues to make more and more estrogen, breast tissue continues to develop. Internally, the estrogen is causing growth and maturation of the uterus, the endometrium, which is the lining of the uterus, 
and the vagina. The pubic hair and acne and body odor and axillary hair are caused by hormones that are produced by the adrenal glands. Adrenal glands are um, <clears throat> small glands that sit on top of the kidneys, and they produce hormones that cause, I call these the nuisance hormones of puberty, <laughs> the ones that nobody really likes. Um, because girls with Turner syndrome have normally functioning adrenal glands, they will produce pubic hair and underarm hair and body odor and have acne. Um, they just don't produce estrogen. When your healthcare provider um, is examining uh, your daughter, and we, we have a way of actually staging puberty. It's called Tanner staging. And we can look at breast development and pubic hair development and uh, see how far a girl is in puberty. So Tanner stage one is no breast development, no pubic hair. Tanner stage two is very early puberty with just little breast buds and a little bit of pubic hair. And then as you progress through the stages, breast development increases and pubic hair increases. So stage five is adult. Generally, menstrual periods begin two to two and a half years after breast development begins. Uh, menses occur when the lining of the uterus has fully matured, and menstruation is actually the shedding of the lining of the uterus. So what about girls with Turner syndrome? Well, first of all, women, infants, um, women, all of us are born with our lifetime supply of eggs when we're born. And over the course of a lifetime, we lose those eggs. They die off. Um, in a woman who doesn't have Turner <laughs> syndrome, that happens 45 to 55 at the time of menopause. But in girls with Turner syndrome, the process of egg loss is accelerated. And how quickly those eggs are lost determines whether a girl will have spontaneous puberty. We do have ways where we can predict which girl is going to enter puberty spontaneously. We know that girls who have the mosaic form of Turner syndrome are more likely. We can also do lab tests that can predict ovarian function. And the two lab tests are FSH and AMH, and the follicle stimulating hormone, anti malarian hormone. Those labs can be checked at 10 to 11 years of age. And if the FSH is elevated, and the AMH is low, that generally indicates ovarian failure. So sometimes this is nice to get at, at 10 to 11 years of age for, so that you know what to anticipate. Because if that FSH is high and the AMH is low, then you know that more than likely your, your daughter's not going to enter puberty spontaneously, will need help even initiating puberty. Well, you, yeah, you can, and, and sometimes you can have a five-year-old who will have an elevated FSH. Um, if that happens, then you clearly know that, you know, you, your daughter's going to need help entering puberty. Yeah. Is there a good reference to this little section of your speech that you read off later? Um, oh, gosh, there's so much. Um, Pediatric endocrinology? Yeah. Um, there's probably stuff on the website. Yeah. Resources, yeah. There's a really good book called Turner Syndrome, I think it's called Across the Lifespan, that goes into this in depth. So timing of estrogen. This is another area um, that has really changed since I started practicing. When I started practicing, we held off on estrogen until girls were 14 or 15. But we um, now know that we can safely begin uh, estrogen much earlier. And so if a girl has no, no breast development at all by age 12, we can begin estrogen. The goal of treatment is to mimic natural puberty. So what we do is we start with a really, really low dose of estrogen and over two to three years increase it to what would be a normal sort of 
young adult dose. Yes. Would that be what you would do with 15 year olds too? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. They have to take estrogen until they're the age of menopause. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. So when you, when you do the estrogen gradually, it allows for um, sort of a normal progression of puberty, just like any girl. Uh, you don't go from zero to 60 when you're in puberty. It's very gradual. Um, and it also allows for normal breast development, normal gradual maturation of the uterus. So there are um, wh different ways to administer estrogen. It can be given in pill form. It can be given in a patch form, which is uh, transdermal. And it can also be given by injection. And I will just tell you right now, I have never prescribed or had any of my patients take estrogen by injection, so I'm not real familiar with that. I don't, yeah, okay. So I am going to just now talk a little bit about advantages of giving the estrogen um, by patch. Um, and feel free to, to um, comment on this. So when you, when you take estrogen in pill form, it's digested by your stomach and gets circulated through your liver before it gets into the rest of your body circulation. So that has some impact on how the estrogen works and potentially side effects. It's, it's safe, we use it all the time, it's not problematic. But we, we think, it, there's some evidence, that giving the estrogen um, by patch allows the estrogen, it gets absorbed by the skin and, and then absorbed directly into the bloodstream. So it bypasses the liver. And because it bypasses the liver, it may decrease the risk of blood clots. Um, it may improve, improve blood pressure control. It may have a more beneficial effect on bone mass, which is one of the important effects of estrogen. And it may improve the action of growth hormone. And you can um, interject, but my understanding is that much of what we know about transdermal versus oral um, estrogen is from adult women. Not, we don't have a lot of studies of this in, in girls with Turner syndrome or in children. So some of this is based on um, what we know about giving estrogen to adult women. But there, there seems to be um, some benefits, and I know a lot of centers now use transdermal estrogen more than pill form. We use both, depending on patient preference. They both work well. Um, and that's something that you can discuss with your provider. So the, the patches, um, God, there's different ways. A lot of them are given twice, applied twice weekly. So you put them on, they stay on, you can shower, swim. Um, some of them are weekly. Um, I think there are some places where it's given nightly, like a portion of a patch given at night, every night, to deliver really tiny doses. Yes, so growth hormone, so the estrogen is started while the girl is still on growth hormone. Because remember, the pubertal growth spurt happens because, you take, because of growth hormone and the effects of estrogen. So the two together is what fuels the pubertal growth spurt. Um, now, if you have a situation where the growth plates are closed and growth hormone is not a benefit, well, then you're not going to see improved growth from estrogen. You're going to see all the other beneficial effects. Yes? Are you saying that the, the advantage of the growth hormone to the patch versus the pill? There is some evidence of that, yes. How, why would that happen? It has to do with increasing IGF-1 levels. Yeah. But I, I think Nellie Morris, there's some other studies that show that there may not be much of a difference. So I. I I feel like I have to do a little bit of a disclaimer here that these are possible advantages, but both work well and are safe and we use them a lot. So it's, you know, there are some girls who don't like patches, who find it harder to remember to do something twice a week as opposed to doing it every day. There's some girls who develop skin irritation. So there may be reasons why a family chooses a pill rather than a patch. They both work well. It's cheaper, yes. Which one? Pill. Yeah, thank you, I, that's so true. All right. 
So there's a second hormone that gets added in puberty. Um, after about two years, we add a hormone called a progestin. So after about two years of estrogen, or if a girl develops breakthrough bleeding, breakthrough bleeding just indicates to us that the uterine lining is mature enough that we can add the progestin. And the progestin is important for keeping the uterus healthy. When you give the progestin, it allows for the uterine lining to be completely shed, and it prevents overgrowth of the lining of the uterus. And if you have prolonged overgrowth of the uterine lining, that's not healthy for the uterus, and long term, it could increase risk of uterine cancer. So it's important that the uterine lining not get thick and overgrown. Generally, the progestin is given for 10 days a month, which results in a monthly period. So you can give the progestin separate in addition to the estrogen pill or patch, or you can give the estrogen and progesterone combined in an oral contraceptive pill. So you, easier. And when yeah. you say 10 days, does that mean they're married? No, no. So what happens is you give the progesterone for 10 days, and usually after they stop it, they have a normal period. It's the, it's the withdrawal of the hormone that causes the period. So not the, I'm sorry, there are two factors. No, that's okay. Water, she's going to have a period. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, know. She I know. She's 14, she started, but when she just got, you know, very recent, either in utero or pregnancy, so she said, oh, I don't know if I have a period. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I know. I know. In what other room would people be going, yes, <laughs> periods? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I have um, some patients who, who take a daily a, a low dose of progestin on a daily basis, which keeps the uterine lining from, from getting thick, and they just, they just don't ever have periods, and they're okay with that. <laughs> so there, there are little nuances of this and ways you can manipulate it. Any other questions this far? Okay. So why is estrogen so important? And I sometimes have patients say, well, why do I have to have a period? Um, who cares if I have estrogen? Well, it's very, very important for your bones. It's, it's important for bone mineralization, for developing strong, healthy bones. So without estrogen, you have increased risk of osteoporosis. Um, it, estrogen can improve cholesterol levels, reduce cardiovascular risk, it's also, this is important, important for cognition, verbal processing speed, motor speed. So it has some really important effects other than physical features in periods. Obviously, it's important for sexual fu function. It re may reduce the risk of colon cancer. And it's important for self-esteem, as we've all talked about. So key points. Um, I, I get asked a lot, well, I've heard that hormone replacement is unsafe. Um, why are, you know, what do I have to worry about with my daughter? So giving estrogen and progesterone to a girl who's supposed to be making it, so you're replacing what should be there, is really different than a 60-year-old woman who is in menopause at a time when her estrogen levels are dropping, adding estrogen back. So they're really two different scenarios. Um, and then importantly, that you and your daughter's healthcare provider will decide when to start estrogen, what form to use, um, but it'll be based on her needs and your needs. And then finally, I just have to say that this talk is in honor of all of the patients I've taken care of who have Turner syndrome who inspire me, especially Nora. Nora gave me these pictures. She and her mother specifically said, put these pictures in your talk. I want other families, especially if their daughters have just been diagnosed, to know it's gonna be okay. She's gonna be great. 
And so these are like darling pictures of Nora. And also Taya. And Taya, as her mom said, I have known for a long, long time, and I've had the pleasure of seeing her grow into this really wonderful young lady. So thank you. Yes. I just had a question. Can I do a question or? Previous, one of the previous slides said that the estrogen might help with cognition. Mm -hmm. I, my wife has read that, um, we have a three-year-old granddaughter. Mm -hmm. um, my wife has read that it's, it's some, some are suggesting the possibility of using very low estrogen in very young Even girls. earlier. Very young girls. I don't have experience with that. Um, I, I do know that there are studies that show it can be done safely. I think what we don't have is probably enough long-term data to know how safe it is to start estrogen that early. So that, I think, is why we, it hasn't been, it's not part of the Turner Syndrome guidelines, and we don't do it. <laughs> You're right, it's to do studies. to do studies, you got to give it to the girl. Right, right. But it has to be done in, in a formal study, yeah, yeah. No, they, um, another hormone called oxandrolone was used in girls with Turner syndrome, which is another hormone that can help growth, but it wasn't estrogen. You know what? It's going to be on the Turner syndrome website. Okay. They, they ran, they had a paper shortage, and so it'll be on the website. Okay.